talked about the time of the judges. We've gone through all of the different judges, uh, you know, with an ex some people don't know what to do with Abimelech, and uh, there's a lot of questions about this time period uh, that I'll probably try to explain here a little bit. But uh, the time of the judges would ultimately be from Othniel. If you remember, he was the, uh, the brother of uh, Caleb to King Saul. Then it's no longer the time of the judges because then it's the, the time of the kings, all right? So, uh, so technically speaking, the time of the judges goes from Othniel. Some would even say Joshua, uh, that Joshua would have been considered a judge up until the time of the kings. Now, when we read it, and I went through the different characters or the judges, you know, we end with Samson. A lot of times we just think that that's, that's done. But actually the time went on a little bit. In fact, uh, there's a lot... Let me just go over just a few things that a lot of times people don't think about in regards to this time of the judges. Um, and there's a lot of cr problems with the chronology. Like, uh, uh, I mean, they're not real problems. But they're problems for us. God's got it figured out. But uh, some of the chronology, uh, a lot of people have a problem. And a lot of uh, scholars and theologians have tried to figure out some of these dates that are thrown out there and how many years this person was in and how many years that person was in and, and how that matches up with other verses that talk about how many years the times of the judges were. And basically there's a few things that we need to consider about the time of the judges. Okay, Number one, it's, it's possible, in fact I would say probable, that there was a lot of overlapping going on that we don't notice when we're reading the book of Judges because it just talks about one judge and then another judge and then another judge. But for example, we do know when we talked about Deborah that it said in the days of Shamgar. And Shamgar was one of the judges and then we stick Deborah in there and call her a judge, but really we, we read in that text that they, they were serving during the same time. And so uh, that's probably the case with a lot of these, uh, these judges. And some ha would even say that when you get to this, the time of Eli, when you get to 1 Samuel, that Eli would have actually lived. Some people place him back earlier on in the Judges. I don't know. I'm just saying that that's what happened. And then you got the book of Ruth, which takes place during the time of the Judges. Some people put her way back into the time of the Judges. So it's not like it all just reads chronologically. Uh, and so that causes some kind of confusion. And many don't realize even that Eli is considered a judge, but... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, 18, you don't have to go there, but it, it says that he judged Israel 40 years. So he was a, one of the judges as well. Uh, Samuel is also called a judge in, chap in 1 Samuel 7, 15. And then, of course, the book of Ruth, as I mentioned, is written in the time of judges. A lot of people don't realize that. And I was even myself tempted to just stop with Samuel, I mean, uh, Samson, and say, like, he's the last judge, and then that's the end of it. But the problem is there's a couple more chapters after Samson that's in the book of Judges. Now, there's one in chapter 19 that I don't want to cover, <laughs> but I'm going to have to. And so uh, next week, Lord willing, I'll cover the story in chapter 19. But in chapter 16 and 17, there's another story that's often overlooked. I wasn't super familiar with it with my, myself as many times as I've read it through. I uh, hadn't actually ever studied it as I did for this sermon and so uh, these two stories would represent the time from the judges uh, that, I mean, from Samuel, Samson at least, unto uh, the kings. And uh, I, I, I want to call the, the message this, a recipe for the destruction of a nation. Okay? Because what we're going to see in these stories is like, wow, Israel has gotten that bad? Which shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us because every time one of the judges delivers them, it seems like time goes by and Israel would go right back into the sin of the other nations. And then we just did the series in Kings on Sunday nights. Every king, it seemed like, man, they just got worse and worse and worse. And then somebody would come and try to clean things up a little bit. And then they would go worse. And look, Israel's in a bad state. And finally, as we're going to learn tonight, the final message in, uh, in uh, the, the series on the Kings is that God finally delivers them over to, uh, to Babylon. And so uh, I want to talk about this 
first story in, the, in these last two stories in the book of Judges. I want to talk about this first story, and I want you to keep in mind that this is a recipe for the destruction of a nation. And if you look at Judges 17, the first thing I want to notice before I get into the points here is that uh, the main problem is lack of leadership. Okay, and this, these last, two cha last three chapters uh, drive that point home by repeating this phrase that in that in those days there was no king of Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so the, in these last two chapters, chapter 17 verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Chapter 18 verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel and in those days, uh, and it, that one uh, doesn't read the, exactly the same, but chapter 19 verse 1, and it, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. Okay, so it's driving this point home. Chapter 21, verse 25. And in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that ends the book, okay? So God's driving this point home that the main problem that happened here and why Israel went so bad, the, the main problem was lack of leadership, okay? So you can understand, as I'm talking about a, a recipe for the destruction of a nation, it's all going to come down to lack of leadership. But I'm going to break that up into a few points here. And I'm going to show you this story as God gives it to us after the times of, uh, you know, after this, uh, the last story that we read of Samson. Now he's going to give us these stories, and I'm going to show you what's going on right in this text. So Judges chapter 17 here is the recipe for the destruction of a nation. Judges chapter 17, verse 1. Okay, the first point is this. Lack of leadership in the home. Okay, so what we're going to see, and you could judge for yourself our nation, you know, but what you're going to see are spoiled children with no real leadership, no real uh, authority in the house, okay? <clears throat> And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now, that's not the prophet Micah that you read later on in the Bible. This was just a man whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver, that's a lot of money, okay? Uh, the, that's a lot of silver. That were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and you'd curse too if you lost 1,100 shekels, uh, and spakest of also in mine ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry. It bless, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Okay, now here's a son who, who just told his mom, who's complaining, Somebody took my, uh, my, my 11 shekels of silver, and, and cursed be that person, and I hope this happens to him, and that happens to him. And whatever the case, I don't know how long this goes on, but Micah says, all right, Mom, you know, you keep cursing about this person that's taking your money. I did it, okay? And she says, oh, blessed are you of the Lord, my son. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not the response. Now, I don't know how old Micah is. He, I think he's older. Uh, but that's not the response that you would expect for her to give. And... Uh, and let's keep reading. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother... His mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. Wait a minute. Is it dedicated to the Lord or is it dedicated to your son? What's going on here? To make a graven image. Well, that doesn't sound like something God wants his people to do. And a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods, and made an ephod and a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, so interesting, God puts that right there. It's just like, hey, these things I'm telling you about, it's because... People had no real leadership, and they did whatever they wanted to do. And what we just saw here is a family where the first thing I notice is that there's no man involved. Where's the husband? 
Okay, all we see is the mother and then this spoiled son who steals this gold from the mom. And the mom says, oh, bless you, my son. Like, anyway, I was going to give it to you. Uh, I was going to actually, I dedicated it to the Lord. But really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build an idol, you know, and, and a representation of our God, which I think was the true God. But God said, don't make image, graven images. And she's just taking it in her own way to like, I'm going to make the God that we want to represent Jehovah. And, uh, and, and I'm going to have it be in your house and be your God. And, and, and it. So we see that there's no uh, father in the story. And that's going to be backed up here in a minute. And he tells his mother after she curses, she, you know, she says, oh, blessed, uh, blessed are you of the Lord. And it seems clear she's got a messed up view of how God wants to be worshipped. Okay? But then again, I would assume she has no leadership in the home either. You know, she's just doing things according to her own will. There's no man uh, to, to, to lead her, no godly influence in her life, it seems like. And that's a little bit of my speculation, but I think it's clear in the story. Uh, in verse 5, we see then that she takes a portion of the money... And she has an idol made for her son, Micah, uh, Micah, who essentially starts his own cult. Puts that in her house, dedicates one of his sons, without any authority by God, dedicates one of the sons and says, you know what, you're going to be my priest of this new religion I'm started. Okay? And it's a religion of, how many cults out there claim to worship Jehovah, right? They I mean, one's called Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> that would be a, it would be a cult. And, and look, I'm all for the word. I'm all for the name Jehovah. That's biblical, okay? But uh, but just because somebody says that they worship the true God, doesn't mean they worship our God, okay? We all understand that. I'm I'm sure. And so uh, and so this guy said, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this own my own religion, okay? And I'm going to I'm going to make this ephod and this teraphim. I think I'm saying those right which is a little bit of a mystery what they are, but there's some kind of instruments by which uh, people would hear from God. Kind of like casting lots, that kind of an idea. Kind of like an eight ball. You know? <laughs> but, uh, anybody remember the eight balls? Maybe I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but you say, uh, you, you say, hey, should I go to school today? <laughs> yes, you should. Oh, man, I, there must be a mistake. <laughs> you keep on shaking it until you get the word that you want, the, the info that you want. Anyway, so... Whatever this was, the ephod. Now, the, the real priests that spoke through God, they did use an ephod okay, and, and some other instruments that God spoke to them through. Not with Micah, okay? He's just making this. He's, he's got a house of gods. He's got this new, this new idol that was made, and, and he's got this. And he's like, I'm going to start my own religion. An, anoints his son or, or sanctifies, I can't remember the word that he uses, his son to be the priest and, you know, we, we make fun of this generation that we have today that is, like, just full of entitlement. In fact, when I said, you know, judge our own nation, and then I said spoiled kids, I saw a lot of heads go like this, okay? And it's true. Look around, okay? And we make fun of them all the time. Soy boys and, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, entitled millennials, you know, and... And, uh, and we, we look at them and we're like, hey, man, they're lazy. They just do what they want to do. They don't obey their parents. They feel entitled to everything. And, and the list goes on and on. And a lot of times we'll make fun of them. Hey, they're, they're out of touch with reality. You know, they don't even know. Uh, and, and, you know, the whole thing comes up about the, you know, the gender issue right now. It's a, such a big a big issue. And most people have common sense enough to say, like, this is ridiculous. But if you talk to the leaders of the schools and all that stuff, they'll say, but, you know, we don't want to, these people, you know, there's statistics show that if you don't let them be what they want to be, they're going to commit suicide or they're going to do this or they're going to do that. So we have to accommodate them. And there's just no leadership. And every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. There's no leadership in the home. Okay. So lack of leadership in the home is the first thing for the first, uh, ingredient, I guess, for the recipe of destruction. What we need in our nation are godly leaders to lead the home. Okay, another thing about um, in the time of kings, there was a prophet named Isaiah, and he says this in Isaiah 3.12, you don't have to go there. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. 
Oh, my people, why? I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Now, look, if, if, if somebody is in a home where the husband left or the husband passed away or something like that, and so there's a woman that's in leadership of the home, you know, praise the Lord. I mean, she's doing the best she can. There's godly mothers who have raised children in, in such a way. But you know what? In our society where a lot of times men just kind of leave the house and they do whatever they want or, you know, they're sleeping around and then there's just like these, all these children that have no leader in the home, they have no head of their house who's leading them and guiding them. I'm telling you that this, what we're seeing right here, shouldn't be a surprise. And although it might not happen exactly like you see it in this story, the similarities are very close. People that are saying, you know what, I, I want a religion too. I'll just make my own religion. And you know how many times I've knocked on doors and people, you know, I've tried to ask them about the Bible and, no, I don't go to church anywhere. Well, you know, do you consider yourself a Christian? I've got my own beliefs. They usually won't tell you, but sometimes you can get them to tell you what their beliefs are. And you're like, you're right, that's your own belief. Nobody else has those beliefs. Like, you just made it up, and you said, like, hey, I'm going uh, to start my own religion. You know, well, what do you expect? No leadership, okay? Which brings us to the next point, which is corrupt leaders, uh, I mean, corrupt re religious leaders, okay? Lack of leadership in churches. There's a lot of churches. I mean, you go to any city on Google Maps, and you type in search for churches, and there's going to be red dots all over every city, okay? Uh, every city has, is full of churches. At one point I looked, and I think there was 30 in this area, uh, counting all the different types of churches. And as there's like 30 that popped up on the map in a, in a town of 5,000 people. That's a lot of churches, okay? And, and, and so, like, there's churches everywhere. But here's the thing. Lack of godly leadership in the churches. And, of course, if they're teaching the wrong gospel and they're teaching the wrong doctrine, you know, that doesn't even count anyway, in my opinion. But, uh, but if you have people, that even though they believe right and they're true to God's word, but there's a lack of leadership. There's lack of guiding people spiritually. And, and here's the thing. They're corrupt and they're willing to, for the sake of having, getting money, tell people what they want to hear. You know, I got to have more people so that we can have more money and all this stuff, and they'll tell them what they want to hear. So look what happens in this story. Micah steals his mother's money, gets it back, gives it back to her. She, built, she has an idol made for him. He starts his own religion. Look at verse 7, 7 uh, chapter 17, verse 7. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem of the family of Judah who was a Levite, and he sojourned there, and the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he sojourned. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite. And by the way, Levites were the, supposed to be the priestly tribe of, the, of, the, of Israel. And so they were supposed to have the priestly duties. I'm a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest. I wonder if he had a black suit with a white collar. <laughs> he said, Be a father and a priest. Anyway, that's a bad joke. <laughs> and I will, give ten, I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. He's like, I'm going to feed you, clothe you, take care of you, give you ten uh, shekels of silver. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good seeing I have a Levite to my priest. He's just created this religion and still thinks that he's going to get the blessings of God uh, for this fake religion that he set up. Okay? But this guy that's traveling through, you realize he's just basically, he's just totally bought off. He's not there to actually do the work of God and like, I'm going to be a priest and actually follow the commandments, the laws that was passed down from Moses or anything like that. No, he just goes and says, I need a place to stay. This guy's offering me a lot of money. 
you know, I'll be his priest. I'll tell him whatever he wants to. Uh, and later on, he's going to. He's going to ask him something. He's going to say, yeah, go up. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just living the good life. And I would argue, I don't guess I would have to argue, but I would say that probably the majority of people in ministry today in leadership over churches, it's just a job. You know, what can I do to keep people happy and make the income and pay the bills and, and get in with the big guys and uh, the leaders of the city, even some, some preachers will use that office for that and get a name in the community or whatever. And so we see in this story that this Levite, he's, he's content to stay and to get paid a good wage. Now, how sad it is to see the religious leaders are content to play the part of a father and a priest in our society. And what we really need in our nation are godly leaders in the churches teaching, hey, no, I know that's what you want to do, but here's what the Bible says. You know, and they're like, well, fine, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you my tithes and offerings then. I don't care. <laughs> I work for the Lord. I don't work for you. And that's what we need is men that will preach God's word and say, uh, you know, this is what God says, and I can't go back on that. I can't change it because, you know, I, I want to make everybody happy. So recipe for destruction in a nation and disaster, you know, number one, we've got lack of leadership in the home. Number two, corrupt leaders or lack of leadership in the churches. And then the next part is the longest part, okay? It's going to take the, the most amount of, of time. I'm not necessarily going to take me a whole, long, a, a, whole long, a whole lot of time, but the story ends up becoming uh, kind of crazy with this tribe of Dan. So let's see, where are we? Uh, let's go to chapter 18. Again, in those days, he's just a reminder here, there was no king of Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. Okay, remember when Joshua died, they had, everybody hadn't gone in and inhabited all the land yet. They were still supposed to be doing that. And so some people kind of got comfortable where they were. Some people were still wandering around. They haven't found a place to, uh, to sojourn. And so I think that's what's going on here. And the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coast, men of valor, from Zorah and from Eshto, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the lands uh, who, who when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and he hired me, and I am his priest. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord is, uh, is your way wherein you go. Uh, I'm sorry, in, is your way wherein you go. So it sounds to me like he's like, you know what, I, just the highest bidder. Like I'm going to tell you what you want to hear, you know, uh, uh, you know, depending on what you can do for me. And this is, he's gonna, they're going to come back to this priest later on. Then the five men departed. These are just spies, remember. And they came to Laish and saw the people that were therein how they dwelt carelessly, careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure, uh, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. And they came unto the brethren uh, to Zorah and Eshel, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good, and, and uh, are ye still? Be not slothful to go, and to enter, and to possess the land. When ye go, ye shall come unto a people secure, and to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. 
And there went from them of the family of the Danites out of Zorah and out of Eshel 600 men appointing, appointed with weapons of war. And they went up and they pitched into Gerjath Jerum in Judah, wherefore they called the place uh, Mahan Ehedan unto this day. Behold, uh, it is behind Kirjath Jerum. And they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. Okay? So let's, let me get you up to speed if I lost you at all. <laughs> these five, they send uh, these Danites are trying to find this place to live. Hey, we need, we're going to take over this land and we're going to claim it. And so they send uh, five spies and they go out there and say, hey, man, this is great. These guys are just, they have a good land. They're living easy. Nobody's really on guard. There's no magistrate that's going to, like, you know, stop us if we just go in there and take. There's no uh, close city that they might, they might be able to call out to and that they would come fight us. It's an easy win. God's delivered. Everybody just wants God on their, claims God's on their side. You know, God's delivered him into our hand. I mean, after all, that priest, Micah's priest said so, right? <laughs> he delivered us into our hand. They're just doing what they want to do. Every man's doing right what's in his own eyes. And so this, these Danites are going and they're, all right, we can take this place. Let me see here. Verse 15. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the 600 men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of Dan, stood by entering of the gate. Let me see here. Uh, let's keep reading a little bit. Probably didn't have to read all these, but anyway, I'm going to anyway. <laughs> and uh, they went up and came thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with the weapons of war and these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, What do ye? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto the tribe of the family of Israel? They just offered him a bigger position. <laughs> You get a pay raise. I mean, the way that the Levites operated were, you know, they would serve at the house of the Lord and the people would just take care of them. And, you know, they, they would just have the things taken care of, you know, just like uh, Micah was doing to them. But in this case, they're like, hey, we'll all take care of you. You know, you, 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 it's just kind of like promising somebody who's, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, as a pastor, you know, how many pastors, and I know I'm, I've, I'm moved past that point, but... Uh, how many pastors will start out in a small church, but man, they've got their feelers out there and they're just waiting for some big church to offer them a big salary so that they'll come be the pastor at that church. And it's like, wait, doesn't God play a, a role in this, you know, in telling you where to go? Here's how the priest responded. The priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went into the midst of the people so they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. And when they were a good, a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook uh, the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest uh, with such a company? And he said, we have, uh, Ye have taken away my gods which I have made. That's hilarious. That's a hilarious statement right there. <laughs> and the priest and ye are gone away. And what have I more? And what is this that ye say unto me? What aileth thee? And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life and the lives of thy household. And the children of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back unto his house. And they took uh, the king, uh, the things that Micah had made and the priests which ha uh, they had and came unto Laish unto a people that were quiet and secure and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon and there was no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth between Beth Hob and uh, they built a city and dwelt therein. And they called the name of the city Dan 
after the name of Dan, their father, who was born into Israel. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, uh, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests uh, to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set, that, uh, set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Okay? Again, I probably didn't need to read all of that, but uh, uh, I wanted to let you see it with your own eyes. And let me just kind of back up and explain a little bit of what happens. Okay? So the Danites come to take over a particular land. They send the spies out. Uh, they meet Micah, they meet the priest, and they say, hey, this is going to be easy, okay? So uh, they come back through, they buy off Micah's priest so that he can be their father and their priest, and they and, and take him into the land. He's like, yeah, sure, no big deal. Just totally just not loyal to, uh, to the people at all. Okay, but that was the last point about there being lack of leadership in the churches. There's corrupt leaders. We understand that. The point that I want to make in this one is that there's a lack of leadership in government, okay? And if you think about it, like these are the institutions that God set up. God set up the family, okay? He designed in the Bible that the man would be the head of the house, and, and he made that rule, and, and he designed everything, and, and, and when people don't do it his way, what happens? Well, the children are the oppressors, and the women rule, and, and all that stuff, and it's just a, a recipe for destruction and for disaster. So God set up the home, and he said how the home should look. God set up the church, and he said how the church should look. But you know what? Lack of leadership. Lack of people in th that would represent God's people, uh, which would stand up for the things of God and say, hey, this is what God wants us to do. There was lack of leadership. And then the third thing God has set up, I realize that man kind of went his own way and uh, set up his own government. Uh, but God did give rules in regards to government and authorities and, and keeping order and peace in the land and all that. But you know what? Government is corrupt. And the thing is, even if the family, even if you got your family together, and even if you're in a church that's got its leadership together, we still live in a nation that's got a corrupt government, okay? Now, my personal belief is, I'm all for, especially the way that our nation is set up as Americans, I'm all for patriotism. I'm all for freedom fighters and people that want to fight for freedoms of our land and fight the, the powers that be and they want to put their man in office and they want to do all that. I'm all for it. Go ahead. I'm not against patriotism. Now, as a pastor, and I would say as a Christian, I would say this, that our focus should be on the Lord. And this will tie in a little bit with my message tonight on what happens with the state of Israel. Uh, but I would say that we're pilgrims and strangers on this earth, okay? Right now, the, the, Satan has, has got control of this world. I know God can step in and God's got ultimate control, but right now God's kind of taking his hands off of it. God's people are, uh, you know, are, are, we're in charge of our churches. We're in charge of our people who are inside the church. God judges those who are without. Okay, and all we can do as his people is just uh, is make sure to fight for the leadership in the homes and the leadership in the church. Not much we can do about, about the government, but there's some things we can do. We can try to, to do things. So here is the problem, though, is, is what happened with the Israelites here, or with this particular area, and with the Danites, is they weren't just godly children of Israel, the, you know, I know their name was Dan, named after the Dan of the tribe of, of Dan. But no, these guys, you know what they were? They were thugs. They were guys that just wanted to come in, throw their weight around, uh, say, hey, we claim this city. We've got the power to do it. We've already spied you out. We know we can take you. And they're going to come with these bad motives, and they're going to take over the country. Now, if you are a patriot, if you are, uh, hey, I'm all for, you know, fighting politics and all that stuff, then you're probably on one side or the other. There's pretty much two sides in our country, <laughs> okay? And if you're on the one side right now, you're looking at things and the way that they're going, and you're like, hey, we need to stand up. We need to make sure, uh, you know, they don't just come bully over us because it does look like there's a, some bully tactics taking place and all that. And again, as a Christian, as a pastor, I'm like, hey, who knows? God's the judge. Maybe God wants bad leaders. God wants to destroy us. Certainly does that in the Bible, by the way, uh, as we'll see tonight. 
But the reality is, when it comes to the, the recipe for disaster in a nation, when a government is just full of thugs and bullies, and they come in and they say, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and the people do like Micah and say, hey, what are you doing? You're taking my gods and you're taking my, you know, my priests and you're taking all this. And they, and they stand up to him and say, hey, you better, you better like lower your voice a little bit or else we're going to hurt you. With, you know, we're gonna... And Micah just goes, okay, and backs up. Guess what? Destruction's inevitable. Now, again, this isn't a political message. I'm not trying to get involved in that. Theoretically, I'm not supposed to anyway as a pastor, but I don't really care too much <laughs> about that. <laughs> if I had to say it based on God's word, I would say it. But the reality is I don't really care that much about the politics, but just from a biblical standpoint, what you got going here is obviously when thug rulers come in and the people aren't willing to fight against that and say, no, we're not going to allow that, there's going to be destruction. The thugs come in, what do they do? Burn the city, kill all the people, take it over, set up their own kingdom and say, hey, we're going to take your gods, they're going to be our gods, we're going to take your families and your children and, and we're going to rule over them the way that we want to rule over them. This is what goes on all around us. But again, the focus is that as Christians, what we do have control of and what we can say is, number one, hey, I am in charge of my family. And we're going to do it God's way. And we're going to you know, not let anybody come in. I've got to obey God rather than man. And so even though I'm trying to live peaceful in this world and I don't want to get thrown in prison or anything like that, I'm going to do things according to God's will, and I'm going to do, stand for what's right. In our church, we're going to enforce things, and we're going to do things that are God-honoring. And if the government says, hey, well, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or if you do this, then we're going to take away your tax status. Well, who cares? Take away the tax status. You know, uh, well, you won't be able to, you'll, you'll have to start paying taxes. Well, if it came down to, like, I can't say what God wants me to say, or I got to pay taxes. Like, I'm going to say what God wants me to say, okay? Now, thankfully, we're not there yet as a nation. Um, but that's another argument. But the reality is, need strong leaders in the church that won't be sold out by people that are like, well, I think we ought to do this. And I think, you know, uh, no, we need somebody. We need men who are going to lead the houses and men that are going to lead the churches. But when people just sit back and they allow all this to happen, it's a recipe for destruction of the whole nation, really. Now, let alone the family and the church. Okay, so, you know, what do we do? In our houses, we need to uh, be strong and not let our children just get away with doing whatever they want to. And once they get found out about something, it's just like, oh, you know what? Well, God bless you. You know, I'm gonna, I wanted to set you up anyway. <laughs> You know, I know you stole from me, but, you know, no big deal. We need to make sure as Christians, which, by the way, okay, I talk about leadership in the church. This, this church is made up of God's people. It's not like I am this church and, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. God's the, you know, we already talked this morning about in Sunday school, Christ is the head of the church. My job is to do what Christ wants us to do. But ultimately, this church belong. We are all part of this church. Church belongs to the Lord, but we're all part of it. So, if a, a leader gets in here, and it could be me, I, I, I hope not. I don't think it is. If a leader gets in here and he's doing wrong, you know what I mean. You can't. It's just a recipe for destruction if you just allow that corruption to come in. So, so there does come a time. As long as as as, as and as a pastor, it's hard to say that because I certainly enjoy the liberty and the freedom I have to make decisions as a pastor and all that stuff. But let's be honest, a lot of guys come in with leadership skills and tactics and they bully people around and they get away with doing all kinds of things. And so, uh, uh, you know, there does come a time where you say, hey, we're not going to put up with that. That's a recipe for destruction. And so something has to be done. <clears throat> and then uh, with the religious leaders, I didn't share this verse. I want to share it real quick. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So the idea is, but people, what they want to do is put a guy in here 
who will tell them what they want to hear, tickle their ears, and, uh, and it says the time will come, they're not going to listen to sound doctrine. Okay? So, you know, it could become a fight between a pastor and the congregation where the pastor is saying, no, I'm standing for God and I'm doing things the way God wants me to do. And the church is saying, no, we want you to do, to do this. You know, it goes both ways. We all have a responsibility, but the idea is to not just sit back and allow corruption uh, to take over in the house or in the, uh, in the church or in the government. And again, my fight personally is not with the government, although I hold very strongly that if God's people would do right in their families, because, all right, let's just go ahead and, and, and put it this way. The destruction of our nation. I already talked about the generation that we're in right now. Well, how is the destruction, how, how, I mean, how is the structure of, of, of that whole system? The parents send the kids to public school. They go off to work. Okay? Usually, this is just the st stereotype, if, if there's two parents involved. Okay? The public school now, those corrupt thugs, you know, that come in and, t and took over. The, the school is, is forced to teach these kids what the government wants them, wants them to learn. Okay? So now, you know, these, these, these children are, are learning, you know, who knows what and doing their own, you know, fighting against their parents and fighting against their church. And, and they're allowed to get, uh, they're, allowed, they're allowed to do that, no problem, okay? Why was I, go I forget where I was going with that, but anyway. It sounded like it was going to start to be a really good, uh, some really good preaching, but I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I know what I was going to say, okay. So when you say, which I already kind of clarified, like I don't believe in, you know, I'm not going to run for president or any office. I'm not going to fight all my wars in the, you know, the town square, uh, the town hall meetings and stuff like that. But if God's people will start at home and say, I'm going to raise my family right, I'm not going to send my kids to public school and be indoctrinated. I'm going to teach them God's word. And then we'll go to church, and the church is right. And so now you've got all these families that are op operating the way God wants them to, and they're all meeting together in the church. So the church is just this one canopy of these families that are honoring God, and they become this one body. You don't think that's going to change a, 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 you know, a town and a, you know, a state and, and maybe a nation if enough of them will, will get together and do that. So whereas I feel like that's not our fight, if we would obey God and do things his way at the, in the family and the home, you know, I bet you he would just kind of take care of the government. And he would just make sure that they, they'll stay out of our business and, and they'll allow us to be uh, peaceable and do the will of, of God. Okay. But the way for sure destruction is just to sit back and say, well, I don't know, you can, you can have my kids, you know. Sit back, oh, you can have the church. Sit back, oh, you can have the nation. And then, well, what do you expect? It's just a, it's just a sure recipe for disaster. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and I pray you help us to fight for our homes and fight for our churches. Help us have strong leadership at home, strong leadership in the church. And Lord, I, I am very confident that if we'll do that, you'll take care of the government and uh, you'll keep the thugs, uh, you know, out of our, out of our business. And, uh, and, and you'll help us to be able to serve you peaceably. <clears throat> Lord, we, we know, though, at the same time... Um, it's inevitable that the end times will come. We know that there are people giving up on all of these things. And, and even in the religious world, people wanting, uh, having itching ears and wanting to have their ears tickled. And, and we understand it's all leading to what the Bible has already said is going to happen. But help us, Lord, not to be a part of that and not to be guilty of uh, leading the nation down that course, but to stand firm on your word, following you, following your will, and uh, be faithful to that. And I pray you'll bless as we try to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.